if you are blaming other factors on your child's obesity, um, like their genetics, which that's not the case, or society, no, you ultimately have the, the, the influence here. If you yourself are obese and your kids are obese, well, this is this is what's happening. They're they're following your lifestyle, and you have the control. And what's gonna what it's gonna take, and this is what I've told parents many times, is if you're dealing with a child who's got some of these issues, the best way to help solve it is to fix them within yourself. Yes, mm -hmm. it might hurt your feelings. Again, I know it's hard, but if your kids, you know, battling with this, it's your fault. All right, some truth time. If your kids are fat, it's your fault. <laughs> Don't run away from me. I just, I just puckered up. Yeah, like, I don't want to get no idea. I don't want to get hit for that one. <laughs> you know what? I'm wow. Gonna you, I'm gonna tell you guys a story wow. uh, yeah. about this. You're in a mood today. No, it's true though. And look, I'm, I have empathy, by the way. I'm, I'm, There's I know it's truth there. I know I made a statement that sounded very Yikes. pointed. It's a true statement, and it's gonna hurt people's feelings. It's true though. But I'll tell you guys a story. I remember once I had a client who hired me to help her lose weight. I've got, a and story I was working with too. her, and it was like. I don't know. We've been maybe training for a couple months. Nice lady. You know, we're working through food relationship issues and I'm trying to get her stronger, like the whole deal. And she came in one day with her son who was eight. I want to say he was eight years old. And in comes in, he, in she comes in with her boy. Now she was like 60, 70 pounds overweight and the kid was eight and he was, he was a you know overweight <laughs> little guy too. And he came in real cute kid and he had his little 12 piece nuggets and he's eating, right? So she brings him in, Sal, this is my son, whatever. Oh, what's up, buddy? High five, whatever. He sits there and she goes, all right, Sal, you tell him, explain to him why chicken nuggets are not good for him and why he shouldn't be eating that. And I looked at her, I said, no. I said, you bought them for him. I know he didn't go to McDonald's to buy these chicken nuggets. <laughs> I said, I don't need to tell him anything. I said, it doesn't work that way. I said, yeah. the reason why he eats this way is because this is what you buy him. And that was, it was like, and the, part of the reason it's was modeled. I could feel the discomfort of the little yeah. kid because she put him on the spot to me. So I put it back on Dude, her and it was, and that's just the truth. I have a, I have a yeah. story like that. I'll never forget because it was like maybe the, probably the only time that I can recall where I like got really angry at a paying client and like laid into them. Um, I had this, this couple, they came in one time and they, they hired me to train their son. Their son had to been, I don't know, I'd say around nine years old or so cute little kid, man. And he's probably, it was, you know, he's definitely, 20 pounds or so overweight for a nine-year-old kid, which is a decent amount of weight for that age because he's not, it doesn't have a big frame yet. Um, and uh, he used to wear these glasses and he had like the, the, uh, like the, the, the spandex chums around his head. And this kid was, so, he was so, he was the, one of the only kids I actually remember I liked training because I've told you guys before, I was not a big fan of training kids. Uh, but this kid worked so hard. You could, you could tell like, um, and I, and, for whatever reasons, I don't know if they were good reasons why he was he was it was ingrained in him to work hard or that was just his personality or what. But this kid would just bust his ass in training sessions with me, and uh, <clears throat> I didn't know this until like our third or fourth session. And uh, we this was at Santa Teresa, so you remember mm. the gym parking lot? Yeah, and McDonald's is on the corner. Oh yeah, and his parents would bring him to the gym to his his workout with me, and then they would go to McDonald's and sit in the parking lot and eat McDonald's. And then that kid, after he just got done sweating his ass off for an hour with me, go and I didn't know this until I walked him to the car one time. So he signed out and he said, oh, my parents in the car. I'm going to go there. I'll, I'll walk you out there. And they opened the car and it like fucking smelled like McDonald's French fries, which everybody knows that smell, mm -hmm. you know, and reeked of French fries. And I was so angry. I remember the next time that they came in, I had pulled the dad in the office and had this like, I was just like, dude, you guys are coming in here and you want your son to make changes around the way he eats but then while he's working out you have the audacity to go to mcdonald's and eat it in the car and then he's going to smell that when he especially comes right in. after a workout because it creates a really bad relationship with exercise Leo, it's like what you, you just burn calories so now you deserve yeah what are you doing yeah and regardless if you let him have some or not i don't even care like at that point it's like what are what message are you are you sending him? I you know I I want to be clear too because yeah. look we all have kids I have three I got one on the way so it's gonna be four it is hard mm -hmm. raising kids it is hard and it is hard raising healthy active kids today in modern times first of all uh, getting a kid to be active is you have to structure it now it's not not like when we were kids where the only way you could see your friends was to go outside and play. Now you have to kind of, you have to like punish them almost. It feels that way, right? To get them to do certain things. Diet is a healthy diet. It's very hard for everybody because food is super convenient. 
People don't cook. <clears throat> um, it's inexpensive. And, you know, kids eat the way their parents do. And mm -hmm. so if, if, if our obesity goes up, then our children's obesity is going to go up. Even our pets are becoming obese, by the way. You can look at studies and see yeah. uh, dogs and cat obesity rates, uh, rates are going up as well because they follow the lifestyles of, uh, of their owners. So I understand it's challenging. I understand it's challenging to get your kids to do almost anything um, that's healthy. But a lot of what our kids do is model our behaviors. So, you know, you can tell your kids all you want, but there's nothing as powerful as I, them watching well, it's observing the whole you. do as I say, not as I do yes. kind of uh, mantra, which, you know, it. I think it's it's easy for, for parents to see, like, a problem, like, uh, within their kids or, like, look elsewhere other than themselves in terms of, like, um, oh, wow, this is kind of getting out of control or this I need to, you know, fix this with, with my kid versus, like, really like taking that hard pill and realizing, you know, where it's coming from, which is, you know, coming from the source where it's modeled to them. That's so, that's such, that's so interesting to me that someone would think that way. I had a really cool conversation with our friend, Mike Slemmy came in mm -hmm. yesterday mm -hmm. and uh, most he, he interviewed me and most of the interview was around dad, you know, being it cause he's about to be a father. Oh, right. Yeah, so he was really right. interested in like my journey of, of, of that and that, that transition. And, one of the things we got to eventually in the conversation was uh, my purpose and like in life. And I was like, man, that's such a cool, unique question for me because I thought I had purpose or knew what my purpose was before I had a kid. And that that's completely changed after I had my son. And not only has it changed, but never has it felt so clear and right what that purpose was like before like, yeah, I want to do this and I want that. And this is my, my purpose. And that was like motivating for me to say it, but it's like, no, I feel it in my bones. Now what it is, is that I'm looking at my legacy, right. In, in, in him growing up and I'm at one point going to pass on, you know, whether that's 80, 90, hundred mm -hmm. years old, whatever. And I'm never going to be here anymore. And the only bit of me that will live on, will live on through him. And my thing that I ask myself every day is the the way I am as a partner in business with you guys, the way I am as a as a father at home, the way I am as a husband with my wife and the way I treat her in front of him, everything I do, one of the things, and I was telling him this, that I ask myself now is like, what do I want to pass on to him? Because I am modeling how I take care of myself. I never in my life, and, and I, has, has this happened where, I go to work out and part of the the motivation to work out is because I want him to see me do that when I don't want to do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And it's less about the pump or how hard I'm training or what program or it's just like, I'm, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I'm lethargic. I haven't trained for two or three days in a row. I need to do it. My son's here right now. It'd be an easy excuse to like, Oh, I'll just play with him instead. I'm like, no, you know what? He needs to see his dad do this. Like, and so I bring him out in the garage and I do these things. So it has given me this, like, so this idea that people that have kids that don't think that way is is foreign to me. It, that it, I don't understand. I don't understand how you can. And I tell you right now, it doesn't mean I'm perfect because I make I make bad decisions and wrong decisions all the time. But boy, do I feel it like fuck. Like I, you know, I do not want him to see that or feel that or take that carry that side of me on after I pass on. And so nothing will make you grow like that. Right. Cause I mean, I do the same thing. It's like, it, there's behaviors that I have that I never really would look at and care about until I'm like, would I want my kids to do this kind of stuff? Right. And then I'm like, okay, I got to be the example. It's really hard. And again, I have empathy for parents because you know, both parents working or you're a single parent. Uh, it's hectic. You got more than one kid or you have little ones. And it's like, and gosh, everybody, look, I am the furthest from perfect um, that you could get w with a lot of this stuff. So I understand. But if you are blaming other factors on your child's obesity, um, like their genetics, which that's not the case, or society, no, you ultimately have the, the, the influence here. If you yourself are obese and your kids are obese, well, this is this is what's happening. They're they're following your lifestyle, and you have the control. And what's gonna what it's gonna take, and this is what I've told parents many times, is if you're dealing with a child who's got some of these issues, the best way to help solve it is to fix them within yourself. Yes, mm -hmm. 
and, and it's got to be the whole house. It's got to be a lifestyle. Like a lot of parents will make the mistake of feeding one kid differently than the rest because maybe the other kids get away with it. They eat, you know, kind of crappy or whatever. And then you got the one kid that's a little overweight. So like, no, sorry, Timmy, you can't eat like your brother or you can't eat like I can't. Like, whoa, you want to talk about creating a situation where this yeah. kid's going to feel like an outcast. So, um, and by the way, this is coming up because we're getting data now that's showing some very scary stuff. First off, uh, this was scary. I remember when I learned this. When I first got certified as a trainer, type 2 diabetes was not called type 2 diabetes. It was called adult onset diabetes. That was the name of it. Mm -hmm. They changed the name because kids started getting it. So it used to be a form of diabetes you got as an adult through poor lifestyle. Kids started getting it. They're like, we got to change the name to something else because it's not adult onset anymore. So that happened relatively soon after I became a trainer. Right now, we're seeing for the first time in a long time, I think, uh, in a very long time, life expectancies for this generation coming up is going to be lower than the current generation. So we've been on this trajectory of living longer, and now it's not only flattened out, but it's actually gone backwards a little bit. And then there was a, an article that you shared, Adam, that today's kids run a mile 90 seconds slower, so a minute and a half slower than their parents did. That's a lot. Oh, wow. That's, that's a, a big difference. Yeah, that's not like... <laughs> I mean, it would be no big deal if that article was like even 30 seconds. I'd be like, what about by the a way, minute that's, and a half? By the way, that's average. So what that yeah. means is you have the few athletic kids, because there's still kids that are athletic. Right. Mm -hmm. But what's throwing it above one a minute and a half over in the average it's is there's extreme, a, the other there's, yeah, yeah, there's a big extreme of kids that can't even run big time 50 yards. Big population now. Yes. Um, and if you see some of their movement even, you can tell that even like if you watch an adult run who hasn't run for 10 years, you can see it in their movement. That I used to never be able to see that in kids. When I go to the park, I'll see kids running, and I'm like, they never run. Mm -hmm. These kids never run, and they're so young. Yeah. So uh, this is a big problem, and we have to take responsibility as parents. So I don't know it might hurt your feelings. Again, I know it's hard, but if your kid's you know, battling with this, it's your fault. It's also you can also say it's your fault if your kid does a good job. You can also say, hey, you know, it's a good job. And I look, I know the there are cases where. You do everything right, and they still encounter challenges and problems. I totally understand that, mm -hmm. but for the most part, you know, it's 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 on you. It's how you guys live. It's how your household is. It's the foods that you buy. They don't buy them. I mean, I don't even know if I buy that, you know, because I know I know people say that, and I know there's examples of of quote unquote good parents that I've seen have kids that end up being shit kids for whatever reasons. But it does what those shit kids turn shit kids for other reasons, right? Like whatever whatever it may be. When we're talking about what we're talking about right now with like health and taking care of yourself. I have yet to see somebody who models um, health in their house unless they do it the wrong way. Yeah, you're right. Right? So, like, like it's dysfunctional in the other place. That's direction. right. Because yeah. you can be dysfunctional it's in the other place. Way too authoritarian. That's right. Yeah. It can become very authoritarian. And, 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 and I, body you know, image focus. I got into this a little bit with some of my family members when, when talking about Max and, and sugar and cookies and candy and things like that. And they're just like, you know, if you do that, he's going to rebel. And he's gonna he's gonna just go over a and binge. It's like no, he's not because I'm not saying he's never gonna have a cookie or he's never gonna have candy. I'm just not gonna fucking give it to him right now when the kid can't even ask for it yet. Yeah, when he like, asks for it, when he doesn't even, you're he's just not, showing him your value system of what you prioritize. That's right. He doesn't. Eat, you know why? Because he doesn't see his dad eating candy. He doesn't see his dad eating right. cookies. He doesn't see his dad eating cake. It doesn't exist in his world yet. So I'm not going to introduce it yet until I have to. And then when I do introduce it, and he, by that time, he'll be able to have a conversation. And then I can have a really healthy conversation around why dad doesn't eat it all the time and let him know how it makes me feel and understand how these foods can make us feel and still allow him to be able to make that choice. So there, there is a big difference. And that's another thing with the, these things, this conversation, Sal, is that I find this really difficult for parents that are making and this and I do have a lot of empathy for parents that didn't find health and wellness until later in in their life and journey and they already have kids that are seven eight nine oh ten, that's a hard ship to steer yeah, yeah. you gotta turn oh, yeah. that ship to turn yeah. it around is very different I have a tremendous amount of empathy for them now if you're if you're a new parent if you're you got your kids young and you're already you you care about this taking care of yourself and you want to set good habits and behavior. You have a huge opportunity, I feel, to really model that behavior and set the trajectory of what their health and fitness yep. is going to look like. It is much more difficult to take you know or put the, what you what do you say all the time? Put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah. After you've let it out, you know, because and I'll tell you, and I've watched it firsthand with my friends that have kids that are just a year or two years older than Max. 
boy, once you use that candy as a bribery tool or that cookie as a bribery tool or a, a, a treat that they get to have every now and then, good luck trying to take it back away. It's, it's, a, it's especially challenging uh, once they reach teenage age ages because as teenagers, their influences become, uh, they become more influenced by their peers than they do by their parents. Yeah. Um, and you've already built this kind of like culture. Mm -hmm. So you have a 13 year old, a 14 year old, and you're like, I just lost 60 pounds. I want to change how we eat in the house. You got a kid who's already in the rebellious age anyway. And you're like, sorry, we don't buy those foods anymore. Yeah. Now we're going to exercise. You're like, yeah. screw you mom and dad. Yeah. I'm not doing any of this stuff. Or it can make them feel isolated, you know, or, or challenged. It, you know, another thing, Doug just put this up there. I think it's a good, good thing to comment on too. There's a lot of kids growing up in dual households. Where mom and dad are divorced, yeah, and one, they live one, one parent is healthy, the other one's not, and this is really hard. You, this can be two different messages completely. This, yes, it can be really hard. And the best thing you can do, obviously, if you have a good relationship with your ex, and you can try the, the ideally, what you want to do is trying to make both households as consistent as possible, at least on the things you agree upon. Mm -hmm. But I mean, reality is oftentimes exes don't have a great relationship in that way. And the best thing you could do is just model it in your household, and then they see the other way in the other household. And then hopefully your kids are wise enough as they get older to say, oh, the way dad does it is better. I think it's better. They, they will. And here's why they will. Um, and I've shared this before on the show, and I think you guys have all agreed that you're the same way too. And everybody I know that has experienced this and, and been aware of their, their own behaviors will agree to this too. When I'm eating healthy, when I'm exercising on a regular basis, I am a better everything. I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. I'm a better helper around the house. I'm a better business. Totally. And so if you do those things consistently and you model that, teenagers are smart. Again, they don't listen, but they mm -hmm. watch and they observe. And if you live in two households and you have one, one parent that doesn't give a shit, eats whatever, I guarantee it will reflect and there's behaviors, their attitudes, yeah. and some of the things they do. And if you have a parent who models health and taking care of themselves, it will reflect in the other aspects of their life. And those kids are smart by that time. They're smart enough to see the difference between mom and dad and mm -hmm. which one of them is taking care of their health and some of that and how that starts. Trust me, they will they will see that. Yeah. And there is a and there is a clear difference in in myself when I'm doing those things and when I'm not doing those things on all aspects, not just the way I look yeah. oh, totally. or, or my performance I, in the gym. Oh, I mean, it's funny. J Jessica understands this hack now with me. If she wants me to like change something, a behavior, <clears throat> she finds a way to, to basically communicate to me like you're an example for the kids and do you want them to be this way? Now, she didn't say it direct like that Yeah, because she's smart. Uh, obviously, she's a woman, so she's got incredible communication <laughs> skills, but she'll kind of find a way to say that knowing that there's almost nothing that'll motivate me to make a change like that. Like some of the hardest changes. And I can be, look, I'm a naturally impulsive individual. I'm going to tell you right now, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for my passion, health and fitness, boy, I could go really, you know, I can go in the wrong direction for sure. Um, but yeah, this is a big one. This is a really big one. And there's a lot of things you model to your kids. We're just talking about obviously diet and activity and that kind of stuff. <laughs> But you model everything, including impulsive behaviors around substances, mm -hmm. your sleep behaviors, how you, you know, the one you said, Adam, which is a big one, is how you treat your spouse. Mm -hmm. That's a big one to me. It's like, would I want my son to think it's okay to yell, right. you know, or to at, at, a, at, at his wife? Or would I want my daughter to marry someone and think that's okay because my dad did that? Yeah. So this is a normal relationship. Like, that's a, that's a really big one. What's up, everybody? Here's a giveaway for today's episode. MAPS Anabolic, the original MAPS program, the most popular MAPS program, the one that is uh, so effective at speeding up the metabolism, building strength, and building muscle. You can win it for free, but you got to do the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, do all those things, and then check this out. We notify you in the comments, and then you will, we'll give you an email so you can get free access. We will never add, you know, communicate to you with WhatsApp, Telegram. We're not going to ask you for credit cards, by the way. The reason why I'm saying this is there's scammers in our comments that are ripping people off. That is not us. You'll only hear directly from us in the comments, and we will only ask you through email, and there's no credit card, no nothing. We don't ask for anything. It's a free program, so don't listen to anybody trying to rip you off in the comments. In fact, we're removing the comments as they come in from these scammers. Anyway, we're still going to give away free programs every single time. Just remember, it only comes from us and not a bunch of fake people asking you for credit cards. Also, we got a sale going on right now. We created two bundles and we made them both 50% off. The Skinny Guy Bundle, which is great for hard gainers, great for people who want to build muscle and strength. 
That includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Aesthetic, the No BS Six Pack Formula, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, and the Occlusion Training Guide. That bundle is 50% off. And then we also have another bundle called the Fit Mom Bundle. This includes MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Hit, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. That's also 50% off. So if you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get the discount and to get set up. Also, at the end of the intro portion of this episode is a paid for spot by a company that we invested in and they're having investment opportunities for other people. So just disclaimer, it's a company we invested in. It's a paid for spot. There is risk involved, but it is, we think, a good opportunity. Again, we put our money where our mouth is. So there you go. Here comes the show. Anyway, I'm going to change uh, the subject on something very interesting. <laughs> I read this article today and uh, I couldn't help but laugh. Very sad, but also I want to see what you guys' reaction is. So <laughs> an Italian man uh, came back from a five-day vacation in Spain. And he's like, oh, I got a sore throat. What's going on here? Mm. Goes to the hospital and they do a bunch of tests. You ready for this? Mm. He tested positive for... <laughs> Coronavirus, HIV, and monkeypox all at the same time. Oh, <laughs> oh the trifecta. All at the same time. Any, any guesses on what he was doing while he was out there? A lot of things. <laughs> he did a lot of shit, bro. All three. Oh, wow, that's a wild night. All three at the same time, dude. What wow. was he doing I mean, in is Spain? It, is it almost guaranteed that he's in a gangbang? I mean, is that, I mean, I mean something. Is are, that a rave? Because well, they've already the first outbreak, What is the percentage right now? Which well, is, HIV so, is sexually transmitted. Yeah. So and monkeypox. Monkeypox is, is mostly sexually, sexually transmitted. Yeah, it's like ninety something percent. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, there was an article that said that it's probably sex that's spreading it, not close contact, but rather sex. Yeah. So yeah, dude went five for five days in Spain. <clears throat> he had a good time. Apparently, yeah. he came back with everything. And he's married. I don't know if he oh, was okay. married. Yeah, I was bro. gonna say she's. <laughs> She's got some questions. But I had people I had people sending it to me because he's an Italian guy. So everyone's like, hey, check this out. I'm like, come <laughs> on, bro. <laughs> Italians go hard. <laughs> bro. I wonder if they like, do they cancel each other out? Yeah, what yeah. happens with all those things uh, at the same time? How yeah. sick is he? He just had a sore throat, wow. too, by the way. You think he that's all worse. he had? That's what made that's him what, go in? Yeah, he's like, oh, I got a sore throat. Let which one do you address first? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, which one is the worst? <laughs> Messed up. Well, yeah. definitely, COVID's probably the best out of those three. Yeah, sure. obviously. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah that's I gonna, would say. Yeah, COVID. COVID. Go, but, uh, although, uh, your know, HIV treatments are incredible now. Magic Johnson has to be the healthiest wow, yeah. ex-pro basketball player I know of. <laughs> and that guy had HIV yeah. for a long time. There's been a lot of advancements there, for sure. Speaking of funny things, did you guys, the video I showed you guys, I want to share this with the audience. They made casts of pro NFL football players' legs, yeah. <laughs> and 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 they they made them so you could walk up to them and put your leg in it to show the size like cut difference. Cut in half, yeah. So you could go and like kind of stand next to it oh, and see. Wow. You know, I've seen, dude, leg. they are monsters. Yeah, I forget where it's at. It probably in some you know basketball hall of fame thing like that. They do that with like NBA players in their hands. In in the and you could put, oh you know I had a book actually that's where I seen it is I oh, had I saw that I, I had a Michael Jordan book that I had a long time it was like a big book like and this. you see how big their hands are and you had, yeah has, my hands okay the and I'm not a small guy and I have I have good sized hands yeah. not like okay so my uh, my my longest right so my middle finger it didn't even go past his palm yeah. That's how how big his hand. Bro, he can slap you. Just reminds you, yeah, like <laughs> like these anomalies. Like it, it's not normal. Like I mean, when you get to that level, I was like playing at the college level, and then you just started to see the guys that were at the college level, and you're like, well, holy shit, dude, I'm done. Like I'm <laughs> I'm I'm over. You know, like I just these guys are way bigger, way faster, way stronger, and it's like you go to the pro level. Now that's the one percent of just that population of of guys playing the hey, game. Hey, how hard was that for? Because I know how competitive you are and how hard of a worker you are. It really what pissed me off. Like I, like I didn't have. I mean, I had natural athleticism in terms of like I could move well. I could pick up. If you modeled something to me, I could probably do that <laughs> movement. Uh, and I was pretty good at it. But I wasn't like naturally gifted with speed. Naturally gifted with like this unrealistic strength or, or anything where I was just like super dominating, but uh, I had to work on just like every day training for speed, training for strength, training. Like the one advantage I had was I could break down film and I was <clears throat> smart enough to know like what I would recognize and I would see it and then I would react. So I would get there before uh, most of the other guys could get me. 
So it was like, you know, in terms of game smarts, like that's all I had. But then once you're at <laughs> a level where everybody's got the game smarts and then they got the genetics and they got, you know, all these other traits that are like, I just was like, I'm done. Do you remember uh, the first time that hit you? Yeah, I was you? just going to say off air, you and I have talked about this because we both experienced this in sports. I don't remember when you told me what age you were when you, when that first, when that first humbling, how old were you when that first happened? Were you were humbled like that? Like, oh, it was probably <laughs> when I was 20. Yeah. Cause I mean, I well, just it happened earlier for me. Yeah, I was well because I still again I was well in high school I was out to get the world. Yeah, I I thought exactly because I was we were really successful and and we kind of dominated a lot of teams at the high school level, and it was pretty easy because it I don't know we played like two teams that were matched and then one of them was better than us, and so it gave me this unrealistic perspective. I was like, ah, yeah, dude, I'm fucking awesome at this, you know. (laughs) And then I get into the college level and it was like. I was like, whoa, not only was it more difficult, I was still like kind of competing, but my best was matching somebody else's like average, you yeah. know, like they're having an okay game, but I was like, ah, putting like everything into it. <laughs> and I was like, this isn't going to last. Like I, yeah. I'm having fun, but this isn't going to last. Yeah. Dude, that was I, so- sophomore year of high school for me. Uh, how, wait, was it in a game or did you just No, it was, with- uh, I, I transferred schools. So, uh, so I came from the original school. Remember, I came from a very small town when I was in elementary, junior high, and then went to uh, high school. In a, my first year of high school, my freshman year, I was in a Division three smaller school, and uh, on the basketball team, I was a star player. I was high score, the score led in assist, steals, like like all categories. I was a star player for sure, and. Then we got, tra- I got transferred. My, my parents moved to a, a little bit bigger town and now I'm moving up to a division two team, which is just one level up. It's not even that crazy of a difference. So there's like multiple yeah. levels of this and I rode the bench the next year. So I went from being star player to, I couldn't even get on the court because the guy, the, the guy, two guys that were ahead of me were significant. My parents had such a hard time with this. And that was so embarrassing for me because my mom and dad were like yelling at the coach about how good their son is. And I'm like, they oh are God. so oblivious to like yeah. the levels to this game. They just, they just see, they saw their son getting all this playing time and everyone's celebrating. And I'm the man over in this one school. And then I get to the other school. And then all of a sudden this, and then they think it's the coach, you know, Oh my how God. embarrassing is that? I had oh, that for baseball. My mom like trying to fight for me to get on the field. All my friends like bailed because like this coach was just not going to play us. And I just I rode the bench the whole season. And she's like, ah, like fighting them. Like, mom. bro, I still have nightmares ah, about it. No, I still wake up in cold no, sweats. You don't. Yes, bro. It was like that was like one of the most terrifying, awful. Mo- I mean, so I remember it. So it's vividly. ego shattering. Yeah, well, no, it's less. No, no, no. That's not the part that it's terrifying. It was my mother coming down and doing that. Oh. That was the part that was so awful and terrifying. I was okay with it. Like, yeah. I, and I've always had that personality. Like, oh, I need to work harder. Yeah, exactly. Like this kids, these kids. Like, I knew the kid was better. Than oh, me. you felt embarrassed. Yeah, no, I like real quickly. I was like, I was humbled. Like Justin, I was like, I yeah. thought I was a shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm, and then I got playing with guys that were better than me. Yeah, and I was like, oh wow, there's levels to this. Like, I'm yeah. I'm the shit in my little town, but here I'm like average at best and so it, it also instilled great work i can think of me because that was a point in my life in sports where i was like i mean probably like justin i was probably a little gifted enough to be you know and he was probably better than i was but i mean i was good and then when i got that rude awakening early on i was like oh shit i gotta work like i gotta really work in order to get this playing time but my parents thought i just deserved it because yeah. You know, I was so good at the other school, and they. Dude, don't the last understand. thing you want your friends to see is your mom talking to the yes. coach and being like, ah, "Like, get him on the field! I can't believe this. He's so good." And you're, I was like, "Mom, <laughs> so mad, dude! Yes. Like, oh my god, dude! Yeah. It was the worst." Dude. I got the first time I felt like I I started to realize that I was uh I was seventeen, and it was the first time. Now, granted, I started working out at fourteen. It was the first time I could do a, a push press with 135, which is a lot of weight for a 17-year-old. That's really good yeah, for a 17-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad comes home from work. It's like 5 o'clock and he's all tired, you know, construction or whatever. He comes out and I'm like, Dad, come here. Watch this. Like, I want to show him how fucking strong I was and I fucking pressed it. And He goes, wow, that's pretty good. He goes, let me see. And he cleaned it with one arm, like literally squatted down and cleaned it, the whole barbell, long-ass barbell, one arm, and he threw it down. He's like, that's not bad. Good job. And I remember being like, wow, <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> that really sucks. Then I remember in the gym, working in the gym, 
I had a client that I trained and he was this older guy, but he was super strong, used to play college football. And he had a 15 year old son and he says, Hey, I want, I want my 15 year old to come on one of our workouts. And I'll never forget this 15 year old kid who like, he just started working out like a few months ago. We're working out bench press and the kid's throwing up 225. Mm. And he was a big kid too, but 225. And then I'm like, okay, there's yeah. a completely different level of humans. There's so there. many, there's so many levels yep. to it. Cause I remember that was my, my high school experience of like realizing that early on and going like, oh wow, there's levels to this game. And then I know Justin's talking about his college experience. And then I remember our adult experience together. He was working with me. Oh, so when you guys played basketball, oh, a bunch yes. of football players. Yeah, we played, we played <laughs> basketball, which not even both, their sport where we were both consider ourselves pretty good at yeah. against a bunch of NFL players. We're competitive. But and you're talking about like, setting. like they're not even basketball players. No, not only are they not basketball, players, you're linemen, like 300 pounds, and like you know what I'm saying. It's like <laughs> just jam it bro, up, bro. Just Dude, they could shoot it from half court and drain. Like it just didn't dunking make any sense. and t four steps. They're all the way up the court. I mean, it was just. Remember when we had a uh, Robert? So eye opening. Remember we had Robert yeah. Oberson here when we were film filming Map Strong. So uh -huh. people don't know he's a he's a, a strongman compare, one of the top in the world. And he helped us create Map Strong, right? So it's a strongman inspired workout program. Anyway, we're filming videos with him in here, and he's doing demos of the exercises. And in, in some of the demos, they're like these athletic drills, because he said that some athleticism is important. Ladder for, drills. Yeah, yeah. So these, some of this is important for strongman competition. If you watch strongman competition, you realize it's definitely very different than powerlifting. You need to have some of these athletic skills. This guy's running and doing ladder drills. And he's nimble on his feet, yeah. like he's 125 pounds. Like, yeah, he's super athletic. Man. And then, that was and then, crazy. And then he sprinted. I don't remember where we were. Maybe when this we were creating the program, and he sprinted. And if you've ever seen a 350 pound monster <laughs> yeah. run faster than anybody you've ever seen before, it's terrifying. Oh, it yeah. was actually a terrifying thing to see. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, okay, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just <laughs> like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. Dude, I, I have some uh, some crazy stuff to share that I, I got to go down. I just right before we go on the podcast, I saw it and it was like, what? I have to share this. Uh, and I will go down the rabbit hole of fact checking. So if somebody, if somebody does it before me, please share. But I just saw this clip on Donald Trump. And of course, like he's in the news like crazy right now because of the Mar-a-Lago thing and everything yeah. that's going on. Right. And so everyone's talking about his money and tax evasion and all this stuff like that. So you know that this fool buried his ex-wife on his golf course for tax benefits. Oh, what? And in I guess in the state of New Jersey, if you if you have a cemetery, then you're exempt of like sales tax, property tax, all these oh, different taxes. Wow. And so it's him simply using the golf course for a quote unquote cemetery, he can write it up as it's a cemetery that of, of, versus a golf course. Now you, now you don't know for wow. sure if he did this. Yeah, I was going to say, is this confirmed or is this? I, so I haven't. I mean, that law is, I think, real. And I, saying. and I wouldn't put it past him. I mean, so I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't put it past him. Any, well, and that's the thing. It's like, if there's some kind of way of like. Doug, maybe break, look it up. Look up Donald Trump, Barry X. Oh, is it good? Wow. It's true. Yeah. Wow, dude. By that the, seems so, by the way, you <laughs> so know, crazy. Yeah, yeah. So so there are lots of legal ways to pay more or less taxes. Yeah. So it's the law system. But I had so I did some posts on Twitter. I was just I was in one of my moods and so I got a whole bunch of, you know, back and forth and it was about the student loan debt forgiveness that they're gonna do. Like twenty thousand dollars per student who makes less than one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. So I don't even know that was poor. All of a sudden that's poor. And then couples making less than a quarter million dollars a year qualify for this student loan forgiveness. And I'm so annoyed about it because, number one, the reason why colleges are so inflated is because of federally backed guaranteed loans. So it's like free money. Of course, colleges are going to be super expensive. Now, you do that with anything, you're going to inflate the cost. And number two, these people knowingly took on and voluntarily took on a loan for something they deemed valuable. And then they changed their mind. Now they want to vote for someone that'll promise that I'll pay for their loan, which is, annoys the shit out of me. So I'm writing about that, and then people on there are like, yeah, what about- transferred to everybody else. Yeah, what about corporations getting their tax breaks? I said, hold on a second. That's very different. One is you are forcing me to pay for your debt. The other one is they're just keeping more of the money they earned. That's very different. <laughs> very, very different. So you can be oh, yeah. upset about the tax code, and believe me, I am too, because it's complicated on purpose for a reason. But keeping your own money is not the same as taking money- at the at the end of Two a barrel, different mindsets completely. Totally. Yeah. Well, so, what and, are we? What are we also? 
How are we conditioning? While inflation is going up, by the way. How are we conditioning our society too? Like we're we are punishing those that worked hard and knocked out their debt and got ahead, and we are rewarding those that are dragging their feet on their debt. Yeah, and and you're punishing people who didn't even go to college. And then and, and, and this then is also tax that. money. The government doesn't have. So money. I mean, it's just they have to take. It it's interesting when you when you, you you pull back, and I get it. Granted, there's 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 definitely people that. Um, this is going to help, right? Like yeah. I have, I have family and friends that I know that still have student loan debt. They make under that hundred and twenty thousand mark. They will uh, be uh, up able to apply for this. Um, and them being family and friends, I still totally disagree with it. It's oh. just another way to buy votes. It's like the oldest thing ever, right? It's a, it's like, hundred percent. You promise that. things, and and uh, it it speaks to certain. Uh, demographic out there like oh this is gonna help me what it, uh, but you don't look at the bigger picture of what that actually entails well, what it does they is don't it, understand economics they don't understand that the, you first have to first understand if, yeah. that nothing is for free and people have heard that statement as like a talking point and so a lot of people are like just deaf ear like oh nothing's for free i've heard that uh like no this is going to help me out and that's as far as they look to it. it's like no it's people are still going to pay for that. And that's still going to even impact you. Yeah. It will, in, it will inflate things. And yeah. so you're going to even pay for it. It just, in, in another way. And, and what, I think one of you made the joke that I'm like, you know, what they're probably going to, what we're going to see in the next couple of years is tuition. <laughs> 10, goes, tuition goes up $10,000. Uh, 10, hundred <laughs> percent. So, that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're expensive because we made these loans. The car we said everybody, yeah, yeah. We said everybody has to get an education. We did these federally backed loans. You had all this free money. It's no different than imagine if the government said everybody needs a car, so everybody's guaranteed to get a loan if they ask for one, and we have federally backed loans. No, everybody be driving BMWs and Mercedes if that was the case, because car manufacturers are competing for lots of well, free we're, money. We're in that right now, and we're getting there yeah. to some to some point. But oh, we is, absolutely are. That go do the okay. The average car payment, I brought it up on the show a couple of weeks ago. The average car payment is what, $713 or something like that? Yes, but here's the difference. If you don't pay back your car loan, what happens? They repo it. They repo your car. So they have, they have, there's a, there's an asset there. There's a, there's a, well, that was the same way with collateral. houses. Collateral, the same right? With houses. Yeah, but the difference with houses, you're right, but the difference with houses is, again, the federal government has stepped in and said everybody deserves a house and has inflated the shit out of it. This is why we had 2008. You had all these banks who were like, "Well, we can loan all this money, and if it doesn't, if we don't get the money back, guess who's going to give us the money? The government, which is what they yeah, did. We get bailed out in two thousand eight. That's exactly what happened. You had people getting loans. Remember? Do you remember applying for? I did. I remember applying for a home loan two thousand eight. The banks were just like, "How much you make? Yeah, yeah. I could have said anything. Yeah, Five million dollars, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. how much of a loan do you want? All right, here you go. Why? Because I know. it was really that they easy. were backed by the government. So what we're doing is we're taking a problem. And we're give, we're adding more of the problem to the problem. So the problem is the price of higher education is inflated to hell. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to inflate it more. You it's crazy. You create an illusion that there's no consequences. Yes. And Don't, then the false equivalency thing annoys the shit out of me because they're talking about the PPP loans, which I have two opinions on that. One, the government forces you to shut your business down. There's a little bit more rationale to get a loan because you can't open it because you're forced to. But I will say this, and I remember when this happened. When they pushed those PPP loans through, which was politically expedient, do you guys remember what like how easy it would have been for anybody to get it? Do you remember no, we, us sitting down? We, we, we qualified for I think one hundred eighty or one hundred ninety thousand dollars. Now we said no because yeah. it was against our integrity and we didn't need the money, but we could have. Well, fact we could have taken me, it. Didn't the, the Pelosi's um, uh, uh, acquire a PPP loan? A lot of politicians. Oh, hell of people. Lots I think, of politicians. I think I've seen some stats on like more than half were. Bullshit. People yeah. that didn't really need it and people that just, I mean, which you're always going to get when it's you the, give free stuff out like that. There's yeah. going to be people that are going to learn to hack and work the system. That's yep. just the thing. Yeah. It's like, it's, that's the frustrating parts because it rarely goes in the direction you want it to go. And there's no transparency or accountability uh, once you start, you know, getting these things approved. No, you, if you give out a quote unquote free money, what you're doing is you're sending a false signal to the market and then the, the, the demand that that money would normally go to or that it now goes to goes up, which means the price of that thing goes up. So if we did this with anything, computers, it could be with cars, it could be, you know, anything, what you'll see is an inflated cost. And school is, is as expensive as it, as it is in this country precisely because it's very easy to get a federally backed loan. 
And now, if they allowed the market to be, especially today with how technology is, if they allowed the market to take care of higher education, you'd still have expensive colleges, but you'd have a lot of other options because people still need to be educated. It's required. I mean, I you'd feel, have a lot of other options. I feel like it's hanging by the thread right now. I really do. I mean, we are so close, in my opinion, to- Just a total revolution with education. Yeah, 100%, I dude. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I was just having this conversation with a, a friend of mine like about how wild it is. Actually, it was Jen Cohen, I think, and I were talking about this, and how wild it is that this generation coming up, like the, the, the just how you would learn something. Like I vividly remember like reading subjects that I was so not interested in and I didn't want to learn, but I had to because I had a test coming up or a report that I had to do. And then I had to go dig in my old social studies book and find what chapter it was and yeah. read it all together and take notes. And it's like, you can now find somebody on YouTube who did a TED talk specifically to that timeline or that topic. And they're way more charismatic, way more, way more interesting. It, and it's, and it's uh, the algorithm is designed to populate it at the top if it's like the most and you got the great most. So it automatically pushes the best speaker yeah. on that topic to yeah. the top. So it's like everybody now has access you know, everybody has their stories, like in our generation, that talks about like that teacher that yeah. like impacted them so much because they were so charismatic and they had all so this passionate. They about were so it. passionate yeah. and they changed the just way. Just effective. You, they were just so effective. They were yeah. great communicators, right? You now, everybody has access to the best of the best on all topics mm -hmm. by searching on YouTube. It's there. It makes or no, a podcast. Look, look. Here's your evidence right here. You go to go to a, go to a, a university take a course and then there's required reading and they'll say you need to buy these three books and each book costs you $300 each or $200 each. Huh? Where in the hell does a book cost $200? Especially in the, in the era of streaming where I could stream that information for pennies only in a place where it's so controlled and regulated and they get so much free money that they can charge ridiculous prices for the stuff. And, and the way that we try to solve it is by throwing more money at the problem, which is exactly the problem. It's exactly the issue. This is why kids go and get degrees for, for things that have no market viability. Like why are you in hundred thousand dollars in debt with a liberal arts degree, which will earn you nothing in the market or art history, great subjects. If you're interested in them, you can learn for them for free, but why would you get debt for a degree that is worth nothing in the market? You wouldn't do that if you couldn't get these free loans. You, if you had to pay out of pocket, you'd be like, "Ugh, yeah. I'm not going to learn this." You know, this I'm not going to you know learn anthropology when the only options I have to make money with anthropology are like a professor. Yeah. Otherwise, there's nothing. Like it doesn't make you any go sense. In the direction of demand. Yes, no, absolutely. You know, it's secure. Anyway, speaking of demand, um, I'm going to talk about one of our sponsors, Public Goods, because I think they're really meeting some demand in the market uh, right now. I'm going to read to you what's on their website, which is pretty cool. So because, you know, we're, we're America is so wealthy and successful, consumers now are demanding things like, not only do I want good products that are inexpensive, but I want the, them to be good for the environment. I care more about the kind of chemicals that are in my products. So check this out. I didn't know this, but okay. So public goods is a company that you, you, you can buy household products, goods. There's some food stuff that you can get on there. And they, what they do is they try to give you really good prices, and they do, but also very environmentally friendly, and they don't have chemicals known to have issues in the human body. And the way they do that is by keeping a very minimalist type of labeling very and minimalist. direct to consumer type of a uh, business. Yes. So I didn't know this. Did you know that their bottles are made from sugarcane? Oh, really? Yes. So they're, they're yes, they're biodegradable. So the bottles are? The bottle. Yep. Technically, it's not plastic. It's like some kind sugar of- Sugarcane. Sugar cane. Wow. Every shipment. So I could eat it? I don't know if you can eat it. <laughs> I wonder. You can try. try. I, you can definitely try. I would um, probably go right through you. Every shipment is carbon offset. So they plant a tree for every order. So that's another thing that they do. And then Every order? Every order is, oh, is offset. That. And then their, their products are free of parabens, sulfates, um, and toxic chemicals that are known to have you know xenoestrogenic type properties in the body. So it's like it's really, really conscious company that also has got great product, uh, great prices. Oh. So as I read this, I was like, holy cow, this is 
cool because you can tell consumers are wanting this. Yeah. I mean, have you guys converted? I mean, I've converted my whole house to it. Like yeah. that's. Everyone. I like the minimalist look too. It's all organized. It does. In the home. I think it. I think it looks better. Yeah. I, li- I like. I like the look of it. I mean, I was just re- yesterday refilling the, and it's r- super user friendly. I actually, this was the first time I did the lotion. Um, Katrina normally does it, and I was. Uh, so the lotion was out, and underneath our sink we have. They give you the big refillables, right? Yeah. So the lotion bottles like this big, the sugar cane one you're talking about, and then they have the big refills, and it's this. And you unscrew it, and then you just squeeze it in. And they design it to where it fits in like perfectly. You can get every bit just, in there. Oh yeah, so nothing. I thought like, oh man, I didn't. I hadn't done it yet, and so I was like, oh, this is gonna be interesting. Is it gonna be a mess when I do it? I'm like, oh no, hell easy. Yeah. And the way the bag is designed, it kind of has like this kind of suction, so it doesn't just like pour out and go everywhere. You have to kind of squeeze it out, and then when you stop squeezing, it will stop. Mm-hmm. And so it filled the lotion up nice and easy, like it's. Yeah, we've been on a mission of just like uh, going through all the products that may potentially have like xenoestrogen type chemicals or thing, hormone disrupting chemicals in there. Just a clean sweep of everything, you know, and just and then what's rad is there are products now that are kind of serving that, uh, especially cleaning products. Yeah, big one that we had to like yeah. get rid of. Well, so. they were doing it before. It was just so expensive. You go to like it some was a small market. Yeah, you store. go to a, like a hippy dippy store, and you'd have to pay nine dollars for a bar of soap. <laughs> Hippy dippy. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> no, it's true. It's true though. Market. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I remember yeah. when it first got popular because I was a single it was guy. Like, it was like those, those, those big baskets of just soap, just open, yeah, and not even like, in packages. Yeah, nine dollars for like one bar or whatever like that. And it's like, man, my Irish Spring is only like freaking seventy five cents. <laughs> like this is crazy. Like, <laughs> I know. So it's so nice to actually have a brand that is you know way com- way more competitive competitive than some of those those like yeah. little small stores. Speaking of uh, of sponsors, so you know how I, I told you guys I'm gonna like I'm gonna start pushing the blue light blocking glasses at home, right? So yeah. I started really pushing again because my son, he really, I mean, he's like me. He could be a total night owl. He can get stimulated, and then I see him come home from school super tired. I'm like, what's the matter? Oh, I had trouble sleeping. So I went, got the blue, got the Felix Grays. I'm like, you have to wear these every day. Like you have to wear these at night. And I'm checking on them. He's 17 years old, so I'm sure it's annoying the shadow. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm I'm gonna find out how much it's impacted us. Because I know in the past when I've done that, he's got better sleep. So you need uh, to get it like the the chums. I told you chums are back in style again. So those are those are cool again. Just tie it around. So, them. Yeah, yeah. Put them around. Put it's them around kind of funny because um, Everett's like kind of the the fashion trendsetter of his class you know he's just always that's cool and it's like it's just kind of who he is like it's I'm, I'm not like um you know trying to kind of promote that or anything he just like he'll be the kid with like the mohawk and then all of a sudden like kids off mohawk and be like, okay i'm gonna change my hair completely now and like do it a different way and i'll, I'll wear this like wild shirt that doesn't make sense you know and like every, the rest of the kids so he started wearing his glasses to school and i'm like Okay, you know, like that's pretty cool. But he, he's, Which he doesn't does he care. He we're, has, gonna to, we're gonna have to affiliate him, bro. And get some commission for him. I know. I was like, <laughs> we gotta get some new frames because they're like small on him now. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. We're gonna get some cooler what, ones. Do you know which ones he has? Uh, I think they're the Nash, but they're like the tiny kid version. Yeah, so he needs yeah. to get like the, that's the one that the we, bigger ones. Those are the ones that we have. Too. Yeah, 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 the Nash ones. Yeah. But I mean, you they got, look cool though. It's just kind of funny because like I was when growing up, I remember like I wanted to wear glasses just because it looks like cool, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you couldn't justify well, so, it back then because it was like either you have a problem with your eyes or you don't, or you're just a, like a phony. Did you guys have kids in your school when you were in high school that were like hustled the candy on the side? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Was so. that you? No, I didn't do that. I didn't. I didn't do yeah, that. Yeah, but I bought, I bought from him all the time. Yeah, you know the king saying? size Snicker bar. Yeah, guy. yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, you you pay, a dollar for a candy. Yeah, you pay like a dollar or whatever for it, and then you probably buy it at Costco, getting it at thirty five cents. It was, it was that was a great hustle. So they were banned at my school. Yeah, you they didn't do that. But the kid, there was a kid. Oh no, yeah, it sat was, behind me. They and, were banned at our school too. But you still, that was the hustle. You know what I'm saying? It was like one level. You know, it's like you don't buy drugs off of the <laughs> off of kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll buy candy bars. Yeah, yeah. No, one hundred percent. I just I was picturing that because I'm thinking of like Everett with like the Felix Grays. You know what I'm saying? We get him hustling. Oh, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, buy two, I'll get you one for free. And there's glasses. <laughs> hey, speaking of hustling and stuff, I I, I see you've been a lot of, on on a lot of podcasts, Adam, uh, and I know that one of your your passion topics is investments and stuff. And I saw the names of some of these podcasts. Are you are you being interviewed about? Well, yeah, like, what they're, what's events? happening is like uh, you know people that can't get to you. They're like, well, I guess we'll take Adam. Shut uh, up. We'll <laughs> <laughs> Listen, now, let me tell you something right now. The next best. Guys, this They're is like, true now. Oh, the man, Sal's, the man too, who loves Sal's too busy. Yeah. <laughs> the journeyman's too busy. I guess we'll we'll take the yeah. other guy. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't work out, Tiny Beard. So and then they interview the whole time. Yeah. So what do you think Sal would say about Shut the- your face. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> shut up. No, no, I, I have. Uh, lately, they have Katrina's ramped up. Uh, I've told her, I was like, all right, I, I feel like I have a little bit of time, so let's start uh, getting me on some podcasts. And so we've been doing more of them lately. I've done a lot, actually, this week. Uh, and most of them have been geared. Um, and I think, I don't know if that's just because we talk about it more, I guess, recently mm -hmm. than we used to in the past. Like in the past when I would do these interviews, they were always around coaching and training where now the conversation is getting steered more around either real estate or our investment arm and like the business. And so I actually really enjoy those conversations. And so it's fun for me because obviously we've been talking fitness forever to talk about some of the other things that I'm excited about that we do. And obviously the investment arm and the companies, a lot of people don't know that we're, we you know we're angel investors in eight different companies that uh, we've talked about on the show briefly. Um, but that's a lot of what uh, I've been chatting it up with these people. With. Yeah. 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 I think the same, the same skills that you apply to um, consistency with uh, health and fitness, they apply to, to finances. Obviously it's different. But it's the same thing, right? Be consistent, disciplined, mm -hmm. uh, kind of think long term, understand your, I guess, your risk tolerance, you know, that kind of deal. So, yeah, no, I'm really excited. And we have um, Harry today that's coming in. And I want to introduce oh, him. Yeah, yeah. I want to introduce him to the audience. This is the first, and we get this a lot. So I'm, that's why I'm excited about it is a lot of people have been um, curious about like where our investments and what we're doing. And a lot of times uh, companies, Unless you're an accredited investor, you you can't. Not everybody can throw money at it, but uh, there are sometimes opportunities where they do this. Like I don't know if it's called cloud sourcing or whatever like that, where they allow you know in, almost anyone. Oh, to it's pre market. So right? um, Careminder, one of the companies we're already currently invested in, Harry, the CEO and uh, one of the founders of that, is here today to share with our audience an opportunity for them to actually invest in something that we're invested in. So now consider this, is, is it always a huge risk anytime you invest? Yes. Um, this is pre-market, so not a public company, so you're kind of like a small angel investor. But you know, with risk, the higher risk, higher potential returns, but always much higher. No, I'm risk, glad so. you said that yeah. because I think it's important that our audience knows too that um, by no means do I think any of us think that we are these brilliant angel investors. What we have done is we've tried to stay in our lane for the most part. Uh, most all of these are in the health and wellness um, and at slash medical space, which I would call a, a, a sister, uh, you know, industry to us. Um, I think that we've tried to stay in things that we, we have some sort of understanding and grasp on. And it makes sense because we are this health and fitness podcast. And if we really like the company and or potentially doing advertising with them, it's kind of a win all the way around for us. Otherwise, it's very high risk. I mean, the likelihood that you're going to hit one that ends up being a unicorn and making, you know, uh, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars off of it is rare. So, you know, we we risk some of our money, but not all over a lot of our money. And so it's important that the audience knows that, you know, angel investing is very high risk, but to your point, can be yeah. massively high and return. And full disclosure, we're investors in CareMinder and they also sponsor the show. So right. full, full disclosure, this is, you know, that, so so let's, let's talk to Harry, see yep. what's going on. All right, Harry, thanks for coming on. Can you tell us a little bit about CareMinder, like what what it is, what you guys do, so we can talk a little bit about you know investment sure, opportunities. Sure, sure, sure. Um, CareMinder is a technology company, and we work in healthcare. We work in a very specific area of healthcare where we're providing technology, not to be the care, but to help the people who provide the care connect with patients, to make it more accessible for patients to be able to communicate openly with their doctors, counselors, nurses. So we divide, we developed a, a program where part of it is what the patient has, which is an app in their phone. Part of it is what the health center has, the, the people that take care of them. And it's a portal, it's a cloud that they're able to uh, view how many, uh, to be able to see many patients at the same time. So our job, somebody described this when I was showing it to them, they said, it's, well, it's an A to Z solution. I said, no, it's like B to Y. They're A, they're the ones that start the patient on what we call a journey, a care plan. And they're Z, they're the ones that do something when the data is brought back. I tell people we perform critically important mundane tasks. <laughs> we go and we get data and we bring it back to the, to the doctor about things like, how you doing today? What's your number? Is your temperature, your weight, your, your blood sugar? We bring back data like, do you have your prescriptions? Do you have any problem with refills? Are you having any trouble getting down to the office with transportation? 
all of the normal kinds of questions that a doctor would want to know on an ongoing basis, but it's hard to get it regularly, like every week or maybe even every day if it's important. You're getting that data. It's coming right back to the doctor, and it's being delivered quickly so that somebody can act on it if there's a problem. We're the B to Y. All right, so who are your customers then? Who's 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 paying for your services? Is it the hospitals? Is it the doctors? How's that work? Right. We work for a very specialized set of clients today, and they're called the community health centers. Community health centers is a program. It's a safety net program that was established by the by uh, federal funding over 50 years ago. Now there's 1,400 of these centers, but because they serve primarily the underserved populations of our cities and towns and states, you're talking about people that are overwhelmingly below 200% of the poverty line, okay? You're talking about veterans. You're talking about the homeless. You're talking about folks that this is the last place that they can go to, and they can go there for free. Uninsured people can get coverage at community health centers. This is a very well-established program. Last year, they got $12 billion in funding just to be there and do the things they need to do to help these people. Those 1,400 centers are one-stop shops. They have doctors and nurses. They have dentists. They have uh, their own pharmacy. They have a lot of facilities. They do not necessarily have specialists. Maybe they have some uh, pregnancy specialists because they deal with a lot of single moms and teenage moms, that kind of world. Um, but they mostly deal with working class folks, people that have jobs. Maybe they have multiple jobs. Maybe they're immigrants. Maybe they're, the, they're uh, people that um, are on hard times and they're just trying to hold it all together, agricultural workers. <clears throat> These places are in towns and cities, the 1,400 of them, or they're 14,000 sites. They're in tiny little towns out in nowhere land on tribal lands. Um, they are the safety net of the healthcare system. If they weren't there, your hospital emergency rooms would be overwhelmed. Those are our clients. So, Harry, normally what makes a, a business uh, really successful is how how big of a problem that they are solving. And so, w before CareMinder, like, how did this stuff get done, and what what major problem are you guys solving that was there before? It's very interesting. This particular group of people, because they get government funding, they have a report card and it's called the universal data set. And it's about a hundred factors that they have to report on. So they can tell, anybody can look this up. It's right there on, on, on a search engine. If you type in, you know, the HRSA and then space UDS, that's, that's the universal data set of the, the group that runs all of these health centers, the funding for them. You look at those and you'll see this group here has, well, like our, one of our clients down south has like 11,000 hypertensive patients. 11,000 people have been diagnosed with high blood pressure. There's a measure of that, and they can say, well, we have about a 48% in control. <clears throat> so they've got over, like over 5,000 people that have high blood pressure, and it's not under control. We're the ones that try to move that needle, mm. get that better. Every one of these goals, how many diabetics you got? We got this many. We have two thousand. We have hundred. We have 50, we have smaller groups. Have we have eight hundred? Okay, how many of them are under control? Oh, about half. Four hundred, five hundred. It's it's a number. It's there. Every single center has this number. We look at that and we say we can help you move that. We can get people who are we call it the red zone, the people that are in the wrong place. We can get them back across the line to be under control into the green zone. That improves their health. It reduces the chance that they're going to the hospital with a stroke or a heart attack or they're going to go blind from diabetes or something terrible. We reduce that problem, which helps the society of the community they're serving. Community health centers are regionally bound and responsible for a specific area of people. And anybody who comes in there is their community. They're trying to help them be as healthy as possible so that they can live lives and be productive and not have to go to the hospital. And they're, it's, helping those people and you guys are having success because of basically how much you've simplified the communication between the patient and the doctors. Now, have you guys done this enough and long enough to actually have some measurables like, okay, you know, when we come into a place that's 50% of the people are in the danger zone or whatever, like how much is CareMinder really moving the needle? Right. We, we have programs now that have been on for a year. Uh, uh, the, last year was pretty ragged. I mean, the, the pandemic made it very hard to launch <laughs> programs, but it, it got going. And 
we have programs where we have data and we've shown it to them that they were ec ecstatic when we showed it to them uh, about a week ago, where we looked at their entire first year and said, you know, you started out and here's a set of people that we, we were able to focus on. We took the data cutoff at the end of March this year, and now there's a new data cutoff that's been added. But as of the March data, you had people, you started off with a population that was about 45, 46% in the green zone. Now they're 69%. Wow. wow. It's a big step. Wow. And it's that kind of number. And we expect that we can drive them. There's actually a, a measure put out by the American Heart Association where they call you a champion of hypertension if you can get to 80%. Now, we looked at the list from last year. There's only like four or five health centers that have ever made it. Out of these, how many again? 1,400. Wow. And we think we can bring almost all of our clients to that point. Wow. Because many, it's possible. How many of these uh, health centers are you currently working with? We have about, well, we just signed up a bunch more. We have about three dozen that we're okay. on, but we're beginning to market out further. And we believe this data from the first year is the going to be the real key to convincing them that they should get on board with us because we think that the idea that we can honestly move the needle in a way that you can see it is what can make the whole thing work the best for everyone. Okay. Now, because this is federally funded, uh, they just, they want to see results, but I'm assuming they also want to see savings, right? Like, are we saving money? through helping more people? Are, are we able to show that as well? Well, we can't show the savings because that's there's actuaries that work that side. Okay. But they know that if you take, if you take a population of 1,000 people that have diabetes and 500 were in, if you could take the 500 to 750 or 800, they can put a number on that. Got it. Because they can say, statistically, we know that that group of people would have been in the hospital. It would have cost a lot of money. We also know there's societal cost of people who are now unable to work and just the, 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 the dominoes that fall when you have breadwinners, the families, all of that stuff. There's people that analyze that well, but it starts with the domino of, can you get them into the green zone? Can you get them out of the danger zone into a safer place? Statistically, a big number will change, a big, big number. Yeah, interesting. In, I mean, this is why we were investors in, in what you guys do. But now that you're you're allowing other people to invest, um, who can now invest in the company, you're not a, you're not a public company, so this no, isn't like buying right. stock. Yeah. So how does this work? First off, how do investors invest, and then um, what do they get for that? And you know, let, let's talk about that process and, and why you're raising money in the first place. Okay, we're raising money to be able to go out and to address the rest of this market. We we have a, a beachhead but we understand there's an enormous need out there all across the country and we want to reach out to them. I have been in the business of being an entrepreneur for a very, very long time and I've raised money in many different ways, but a new vehicle came out in 2016, I think is when it was launched when this ability to have kind of a public private offering where ordinary people could come in it used to be you had to be a sophisticated investor and pass all of these statements of how how sophisticated you were in terms of having a, a large amount of money, assets, net worth. That's all been left out. Right. The new model is an ordinary investor, an ordinary person that just has a job and wants to get in early on a company. There's new a vehicle for them, and it's called Reg CF. It's Security and Exchange Commission. It's highly governed. And you have to go through one of the portals. So you ask, how do you do this? The largest portal in this particular niche, the largest broker, if you will, the 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 kinds of people that you might buy stock from on a there's a there's there's about a dozen of them. The biggest is called Start Engine. That's the one that uh, actually approached us in January and said, you know, the rules have been changed. You can raise a lot of money now. Would you like to try this? Well, we had never heard of them. We investigated it, said this is a really interesting way to let ordinary folks invest a few hundred, a few thousand dollars, whatever is comfortable for them, but get in early when the company is going to grow greatly so that that money, it doesn't move in small numbers, we hope, but it actually grows rather rapidly into big numbers that were never available to the ordinary investor. So basically, if you're interested in investing, you just go to Start Engine. And you look up CareMinder. So it's just startengine.com slash CareMinder. And 
at that point, you're going to see all of the information. You'll see a video that... Uh, we actually, you guys helped us make the video. My little section was 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 uh, recorded right here in this studio. <laughs> uh, but then our video guy got in and did all the magic that he does. Um, but you'll see a three-minute video about us. You will see an awful lot of information on there about the market, about the, the team, about the product, about our financials, about updates that we've been sending. Everything on there was run through compliance attorneys just like we were a public offering. It was a painful process to have to, every number we mentioned, we had to provide backup research information so that the attorney that I've never met, it's just a name to me, that they would be, they would have on hand the evidence that we're talking about something. When I said 1,400, I had to prove it was 1,400. When I said it was $12 billion in funding, I had to send them a link to show them where they could look that up. When I said that this is a 50-year-old program, they wanted to see a link that it was a 50-year-old program. Every single fact in there has been double, triple checked. So an investor can believe that they're reading something that is truthful and detailed and tells the story very accurately. Is, and you can get in early. Is there a minimum? There is. Uh, it's on the sheet there. It's below $300. But it's on, when you look on there, there is a set of terms. They're right there on the first panel that you see. You have to scroll down to read all the information. But if you look at that first panel, it will show you that. It will show you the price per share. It will show you the the uh, the minimum investment. It will also show you that there are uh, bonuses, incentives, that if you invest a certain amount, that you get extra stuff. So there is a larger number that you might get a few, a few percent on top. So your money goes further. Got it. So essentially, it. you invest, it gives you a certain amount of shares. Then at some point, there's an exit strategy. Uh, you know, company either goes public or sells, and then those shares are worth more, and then the person reaps the benefit, correct? That's that, how the exit works. Otherwise, their money's there, and they don't. I mean, that's well, the risk, right? Well, no, that, that that's not quite. You're, okay. you're exactly right with what you said. No, somebody could actually potentially buy out your shares at one point. So if somebody right. comes after in and a says, year, yeah, so after a year that we close out, and this 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 particular funding will be closing in a, in at the end of September. After and there is a time period. It's like a year. There will be a secondary market. So let's say we're doing great and we're in the news, and one of the people holding shares wants to sell some. They're allowed to in what's called a secondary market, Got and it. the same people, Start Engine, runs that market. So even if we haven't been acquired or sold or gone public. And believe me, that is part of our corporate goal someday. Um, you know, even if that hasn't happened, there's still going to be some availability for liquidity for these investors. It's a really, I think from that standpoint, it's a really good system for ordinary investors who can't hold their, 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 their position forever. Mm -hmm. and may have something they want to uh, cash out on. Not only that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it, isn't it common, like in a situation like this, where, um, you know, like you said, you guys start to get national attention, and then a, a big firm comes in, and they want to make a major contribution. And part of making a major contribution, they want to swoop up a lot of the small they investors. They very well could make an offer to the investors. Yeah, that that has happened in other companies yeah. that I've been involved in, that they want they want more complete control. Maybe they only want the employees to own. Mm -hmm. They will make offers to outside people. Right. And that will be something that will be done then if that were to happen. Right. Awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, again, full disclosure, we're invested in uh, your company because we like what you guys are doing. We we'll believe in what you guys are doing. Um, but of course, again, full disclosure, anytime you invest as an early investor in a company is always high risk, right? Um, the, the, the risk is that you, the company doesn't do well or there is no exit, in which case you lose uh, your investment. However, um, like with all investments, high risk typically means high return if there is success. But nonetheless, um, again, we, we, we like what you guys are doing. We support it for sure. And I appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, the only thing I'd add is that the team you look at when you see the pictures of us and stuff, one thing we can say is we've been through this rodeo before. We have started companies. We have had successful exits. I have had successful exits. Uh, my, my, my kid's college fund is delighted with that. But the bottom <laughs> line on it is that, uh, um, you know, this is probably the most important work I've ever done in my career. It gives back to people that need to be given back to. It, it advances the technology of something that's fundamental to all of our lives, the technology of healthcare. It, it makes 
everything work better for the patient makes people who have to deal with something that lasts for a while, whether it's whether it's one of these conditions or a pregnancy or, you know, even a, a spout of depression that they've got to handle. It makes that easier to get solved. And so this is, obviously, I'm very excited about it, but uh, it's not it's not just the corporate side. It's also this 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 idea that within a community, we're giving the right things back to them. One last thing, actually, before we wrap up, because we didn't touch on this, and I do believe that there is a little bit of urgency around this for these investors because... Doesn't this round close in September? It, it, it does close. It closes on September 29th. Okay. That's on the sheet. Okay. Got it. You'll see it there. And um, so we're trying to encourage you that if you if you think about it, read the information, look at all the things on there. There's a f- set of updates. We send an update out every, every week, maybe a couple of times. There's a big one coming out shortly that's going to be up there, or maybe it just went up um, because we, we, a deal that we've been working on for a long time got concluded. So- You'll see the Michigan announcement. I think it's up now. Um, but please read all the information. Feel comfortable with it. And if it makes sense for an investor to get in, get in. You guys, we believe in the stuff you say about health and fitness and that that is as much an emotional and psychological step forward as it is a physical. We think it's the same thing in the world we're working in. Agreed. Awesome. Thank you again. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Thanks Harry. What's up, everybody? Look, uh, everybody knows about the potential benefits of CBD. Uh, Helps relax some people, helps with inflammation, can help some people sleep. The problem is most CBD products in the market suck. They totally suck. You take them, you try them out, you don't feel anything. That's not the case with NED. So NED is a full-spectrum hemp oil product. So it contains CBD, but also contains the other active cannabinoids in the hemp plant, thus working much more effectively. NED is actually a product you can feel. So try NED. 45 minutes later, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You can really feel it. It's one of the most successful uh, hemp oil companies around. We were with them since the very beginning. We love them. Go check this company out. Go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash mind pump. Then use the code mind pump for 15% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first question is from Randomly Randy. What's the best way to get better at push-ups when you can barely do them? Okay, so this is actually um, actually quite simple. Um, of course, all things being equal. So if you're healthy, no pain, injury, that kind of stuff. First off, find a version of push-ups where you can do at least five to eight reps with moderate intensity. So you have your traditional push-ups where you're on your feet and hands. You can go to knees. You can do elevated push-ups where you're using like a, a bench or a counter. So find a version of push-ups that you can do. Um, so obviously scale it back. Be able to do five with moderate intensity and then literally practice them every single day. Once those five become super easy, do 10. Once that becomes super easy, then move to a more challenging version of push-ups until eventually you get down to the floor and then you start practicing I mean, traditional push-ups. I've had clients that... Um had this issue and, and we, like I couldn't even I couldn't even do an elevated push up so we would even do it on the wall uh, to start so it's, there's just scale of of intensity in terms of like what angle will be appropriate and if it's really is it the wrist that's the issue that you're know, putting pressure on uh, is it the lack of strength um, it, these are all things that I would I would start to consider and like scale that. Uh, I mean, even one, one good one too was, uh, which I never use this machine, but I use it for this one purpose alone. Um, which is Smith, I machine. Even for, Smith. Thank you. Oh yeah. I even I forgot the that. name of it. Cause it's, cause it's we so all did, useless to me. We all did pushups on that. Right. Yeah. But I mean, you can like, you could set it up and then they could actually grip it. I think the important part for that is like establishing a good firm grip. Yep. Uh, and then making that fist and then start in that direction. So that way that you can kind of divert a little bit of the pressure on the wrists. Yeah. So technically I'm the most qualified to answer this. Yeah. Um, based off the of push-up king. I mean, well, based off of I have the most viral video around push-ups of the three of us on YouTube channel. Oh, so. you do. All right, all right. <laughs> We're gonna get the popcorn so, out. So that's just because no, you're super handsome. Though. No, no. Uh, actually, it, it is one of the more viral videos that we did. I did it on uh, basically uh, like the perfect push-up and and how to regress it and progress it. So if you haven't watched that video, I know I see Doug over there searching for it right now. So if you go to Mind Pump and then I think perfect push-up. Type in most viral push-up video. <laughs> No, that mind pumps he's 
actually just altering. Just the type of in mind right pump, now. and then I think perfect push up. Maybe Andrew, what what will get it? I'm pretty sure that will get it. And then you'll, yeah, that's it, right? And then I show regressions to your guys' point from my knees. I talk about going for, to the floor and hand release and then make, pulling your shoulders back. Like It's a good uh, video. Yeah, I think it's it is. It's a really yeah. good video. Yeah. By the way, you made a comment about gripping something. Here's a tip for push-ups. If your wrists bother you when you're on the floor, when, you're, when you have your hands on the floor, don't just relax your wrists and allow the joints to support you. Grip the floor. Actually create tension like you're trying to grab the floor. Kind of push out like in a spiraling kind of a Yes. So tension. grab the floor and like you're trying to twist. You don't actually twist, but create that tension and then watch how much more stable you feel with your push-ups. Next question is from Kim and Lexi Adventures. How important are core specific exercises if you always brace your core while lifting? I mean, I don't know. Like how important are bicep exercises if you only do back or how important are tricep exercises if you only do shoulders? In fact, I would say it's even this is more the power lifting argument. Right? It is. I, I would say it's even more important because unless you do core specific exercises, the core is definitely getting stronger with certain exercises, but the core is not being trained through a full range of motion. So it's really being trained as this stabilizer the static stabilizer. And in real life and everyday life, you're going to be put in positions where you're not in this perfect position to stabilize. You're going to bend over to get something. You're going to have to sit up off the floor. And if you don't train your core through those ranges of motion, the strength difference between stabilizing and actually going through full range of motion is actually kind of large. So I've done this with people where they're good squatters, good deadlifters. They never really train their core. Then we go do a real like physio ball crunch and they're shaking as they go through the full range of motion. So it's important to train your whole body uh, through all the ranges of motion. That's interesting. You think it's actually more important? I don't know if I would agree with that. I don't know if I'd agree that I think it's more you know why important. I, say I, I would think that somebody who has become a really good squatter and deadlifter, um, obviously you built some good core stabilization yeah. strength which is better than the person who's doing neither one. Well, no, no. I mean, it's okay. So I, I use the example of like biceps, not working your biceps. even Which though by the rows. way is a great analogy, I think. It is. But the difference is when I'm doing rows, I'm at least training my bicep through a range of motion. Yeah. It's, it's not just stabilizing is what I'm saying. Yeah. When you're using your core as a stabilizer, you're strengthening it in be that more position. Like a deadlift, right? Yeah, you're not you're not using it through its full range of motion. No, you're. I mean, you're. It's not that you're not right to your point of like like it's they're different. I mean, yeah. you're talking about a to whole different adaptation. Like, but I mean, somebody who's gotten really good at squatting, deadlifting, and they're lifting good weight, and they can brace and st stabilize their core. I think has a lot of value and carryover into just protecting your spine and your low back in like everyday life. Doesn't mean you have a very strong quote unquote core because you're not training it through full range yeah. of motion, and it's only really good at stabilizing. But I still think that that person is in a way better position than somebody who is not training. Their of course, of course. Yeah, I was yeah. I was comparing it to the bicep uh, argument. But, uh, I mean, you take that power lifter, and I've I've seen people like this. So they can squat and deadlift a lot, and then they hurt their back, like like twisting to pick something exactly. up. Exactly. That's I mean, that's really where I'm at. Two, when you when you get so strong in that one direction, you're even more vulnerable. Yes. At uh, you know some of those everyday average movements that you're going to get caught up. Um, just lifting something like you could easily lift and then rotating it or just losing your balance slightly. And uh, the compensation that happens and occurs uh, because your muscles fire so hard, uh, you could you could tear something. So yeah. if I were to, if I had an order of operation on this person, right, who like trains deadlifting and squatting and good core bracing, but then not training their core, I actually would prioritize rotation first. Yes, mm -hmm. Agreed. Because I, I think then you uh, rotation and then doing what you're saying, full range of yep. motion crunches, but their, their highest risk is for sure yeah. doing something where they're rotating. I'd say rotating, rotating and bending while Crunching rotating. Crunching up is less likely like uh, you're going to experience that. Uh, Especially if they've but, already kind of built some sort of stability in the yeah, sagittal plane right, like that, right? Yeah. They have some strength and stability, even though they don't have good full range of motion, right. they're not weak and instable in that situation. So they're at least, yeah. but rotating, yeah, rotating, I would say rotating, rotating and lateral flexion and extension yep. because sure. um, you know, the QL, that's an often, that's a muscle that's often pulled. Yep. Okay. okay let me, let me paint the scenario. Strong guy works on the gym. He could deadlift 500 pounds. He could squat 400 pounds. He goes to move his couch, and it's a heavy couch. It's a 250-pound or 300-pound couch. So he can lift it because he's really strong. He's moving it. He steps a little wrong. His body twists. He was able to lift it, but he wasn't able to stabilize it while rotating because he never trains right. that. Boom. Hurts himself. Why? Or because one side lowers yes. versus the other. You get that lateral stability issue. Like you said, the QL leaves that 
completely susceptible. Yes, yeah. So you, you can have isometric strength, and there's carryover to ranges of motion outside of that, but it doesn't carry all the way over. So you definitely want to train everything in, in, in full ranges of motion. Next question is from MT Rave. How accurate are trackers such as Fitbit at measuring neat and calories burned? Oh, this is a great I'm gonna I'm gonna say something controversial in response to this. They're extremely accurate. Mm. They're super <laughs> accurate. Compared to what? Let's fact check that. Well, here's yeah. here's why I'm gonna say that. Okay. It's people want to tear them apart on um where they're where they're inaccurate to their current you know metabolism or and this person's asking about their daily need that part is irrelevant to me what they're really good at and very accurate is consistently reporting that data based off of you in other words if i get it what i don't care about so like let's say a client gets the fitbit it's their first week of wearing it for me because i used to use it all the time like this and they're like hey it says i'm burning on average uh, 1800 calories. I don't give a shit if it says 1800 or 2700 to me. It's that's irrelevant. What I care about is that what it's saying consistently now, and then the things that I decide to add or take away in their routine and or diet in relation to their food. So you're looking at what you're, what you're saying in other words is the trend you're yep. watching the trend. That's all I'm using. Is it, it going for. up? Is it going down? That's where. The and they are insanely is. accurate for that. Yes. Like, let's say you go for a walk for 500 steps, you know, and let's say the steps are actually off, and you really took 527 steps, and the and the calorie burn says it was 500 calories, but it was really 523. It doesn't. That doesn't matter. It's going to measure the same. Each and time. every time you take those 500 steps, it's going to repeat and and, and measure yeah. the it the same way. So it's going to give you a very consistent report and feedback on your daily activity and your burn. Where people fuck up is they do it and then they see what it says your quote unquote burning in the day and then they eat according they try to eat and match those yeah. calorie burns which is like completely wrong. Yeah, I totally agree. I think yeah, if it if it does its job which it does well is if you're less active for that day it'll show that in your number metrics that it's accumulating. Yeah, it's the trend that's you know what it reminds me of body fat testing. Yes. Everybody freaks out. Well, I don't know, body fat tests can be off by 4% or 3%. Well, that doesn't matter, but if you test your body fat every other week for a year, you'll see a trend. And the trend is is pretty damn consistent. It's going up or it's going down. Same thing with these. So yeah. forget the total calories if that's accurate because they're not super accurate on that or as accurate as you know, going to Stanford and have them hook you up to some of the most sophisticated machinery. Well, there's an argument too. It's like the arm swing versus actual steps. And yeah. it's just like, again, to the to that point, it's just, that's pretty much irrelevant as long as it's like patterning your your overall movement. Yeah, because it's going to figure that out, right? So yeah. that's a great example. Like yes. Katrina used to always be like, it's not fair. Your Fitbit registers so much more because you talk with your hands. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah, saying? but you always talk with your hands. <laughs> right. But I always if talk Italian, with my roof, I always you know? do that. And that does burn calories. I'm not technically walking, and so it's what registering incorrectly. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It'll show if you're more or less active. That's right. Yes. And it, and it, and and that's all I care about is that it's it gives me a baseline of, and so the actual number that everybody gets hung up on, and then how accurate is that number to my? Who cares? It, that's not how you should use it. The way you should use it is eat a certain way consistently, and just choose somewhere where you think. Is your maintenance level? You don't even have to be perfect, but or if so, say it's two thousand calories, you don't gain or lose. That's your maintenance. So eat at two thousand calories consistently for a week while you wear your Fitbit. If you did a good job of finding your maintenance, you shouldn't see any fluctuation of weight up or down. And then whatever that thing reads and tells you, steps and calorie burn. Use that as this is my baseline. When I eat 2,000 calories and I move this much, it maintains yeah. my body. Now, when I add this many more steps in the day and or push this thing to say it burns 500 more calories, if I keep my calories the same, I should have a 500 calorie deficit yeah. now. Or if I keep my activity the same and then but, but reduce my calories by 500, I should now have a 500 calorie deficit. Don't get hung up on that, oh, this thing is inaccurate. It says it. By, by the way, to be very clear, 95% accuracy at measuring a metabolism. Mammalian metabolism is extremely complex. Yeah, that's amazing. But 95% accuracy is incredible. But that's still 5%. 5% over the course of six months or a year is a huge amount of calories and it can make a huge difference. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They can be 98%, still 2% makes a big difference over the course of a year. What's important is the trend, and the trend is consistent. And if you, unless you drastically change the way you walk, 
So like you normally walk like this, and then tomorrow you're like I'm gonna trick this and walk like this. Listen, let me. Well, yeah, now you're gonna see like li- I'm a hu- I'm right. a huge proponent of these things. So li- listen to me when you w- you think that's inaccurate. You want to know what's even more inaccurate? You telling me how active you are. You telling me how much food you ate right. without fucking tracking. And you can tell me you think you know and you think you're really good. You know how off you are? You were so off. You well, were so off on your steps. You were yeah. so off on your movement. Way beyond this thing. So it's an incredible tool for feedback to get closer to having an idea of what your body probably burns. I suspect that's probably one of the biggest factors for messing up that whole formula uh, for for figuring out your maintenance calories. Right, because people like overassume how active active they are. Yes, and it's like it gives you like these options of like slightly active, Dude, very active, like you, incredibly active. If you, oh, I'm incredibly active. If you work a desk job, okay, so eight to ten hours a day, you sit at a desk, and the only time you're active is one hour workout every day, seven yeah. days a week. And you you're work training out for an like hour. a maniac. You're an athlete. You train hard. Seven an days hour a, a day, week. seven days a week. You're but then, sedentary. But you're sedentary. Yeah. Because you that's at, one hour out of your entire which is day. Crazy, but yeah. it's true. Yep. Yeah, but that just shows you how off we are at, at estimating ourselves. At what well, we what think. it is, we compare ourselves to everyone else. Well, I work out every day, and John doesn't, so I'm super active compared to him. Well, that's yeah. true. I, I mean, I uh, these these tools. Uh, I credit those tools that gave me the ability to to compete to 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 at that level. Like I don't know if I could have done it without that i think you could i, I have faith in you maybe now yeah. <laughs> maybe I, I believe i could do it now because i've been through all of it and i've yeah. i learned a lot no, 100 i agree th- those tools gave me uh, incredible feedback yeah, try to get down to three well, percent body fat without having trends that you could follow like oh my god you're guessing you're totally. guessing at best and this is where that, that whole strategy of like you know not really focusing on the the cardio to uh you know increase the number of like now you can actually have this data to then pull from like okay i just need to be more active throughout the day and and i can do that in a way where i am affecting my body fat and in a way where i'm not like just adding more cardio which is what everybody does they just throttle down on cardio to burn it off next question is from nicholas costa 3517 do you target a postural problem or a weight problem first with a client well let, let's let me change the question a little bit just before so we don't get uh into the weeds uh or get controversial with posture problems because that's kind of a, a, a controversial statement would you work with per, a person's movement first in other words getting them to move better and to have more stability first or get them to lose weight first movement mm. movement first because the process of getting somebody more fit and stronger is also the process, if you do it right, of speeding up the metabolism, which also aids in weight loss. And also weight loss is much more complicated than strength training in the sense that when you meet with me three days a week, we're strength training, you're doing what I'm telling you. The rest of the time you're not with me, that's what deal, that's the weight stuff. So I I never take a client and go, I don't care what you're doing, work out, we're gonna yeah. make you lose weight first. Yeah, I know you're moving wrong. I know your back hurts, whatever. I, I you gotta focus on that stuff first. I think, yeah, and and I read this question as like if you're a new trainer, right? And you're kind of going through this, like, what's the most important thing? Uh, especially if somebody is in like if they're o- overweight, they're obese and they have like some bit of joint pain, but it's like you know, and you know that you could kind of take them through, uh, you know, more of the movement and the mobility and that side to really help kind of get towards that. But it's going to take a bit of time to get there versus you thinking as a trainer, like maybe if we just shed weight, it's going to now, like some of these problems are going to resolve and this pain is just going to sort of go away, which is like in my experience going through this has never been the case. Mm. Like this is just an underlying issue that uh, needs to be needs to be addressed and also like incorporated as you are working your way towards strength training in that direction. I'll tell you what's wrong with this question is this comes from a place of still measuring the effectiveness of a workout by the calories it burns in the workout. Like that's so insignificant. Yeah, the workout is the workout. Like if I train somebody, so let's just use, so we can be very like practical here and like give someone a visual kind of like example of like, okay, so very common, uh, upper cross syndrome, right? Rounded shoulders, forward head. Um, I can address that while also writing a quote unquote weight loss program for this client. Right. Right. So like, and and, that's the individualized part of the workout. Yeah. And, and doing (laughs) mobility and doing, uh, you know, seated row and retraction and, and, uh, you know, 
uh, supine scorpions and you know movements that are going to benefit their posture is burning calories and is building muscle therefore it's still a, a program that is being is designed to hopefully get this person to lose weight mm -hmm. and the only thing that could be potentially more superior towards the weight loss quote-unquote goal would be if you were intentionally doing a, a more activity to try and burn more calories in the workout you know what i'm saying Otherwise, it is a weight loss program. Like I get a client who wants to lose weight, but also has all kinds of posture issues. So I write a program that's designed to build them muscle, speed up their metabolism, while also doing exercises that are going to yeah. correct their posture. Yeah, or I see. Help it. I see this person asking with the thought process of like hit training or something being right. the the best yes. program for weight loss. Right. That's it, exactly what I think too. Yeah. yeah. Look. It, look. Because um, you're thinking about calorie burn right now, right. which. Get rid of that. Totally. It's so, just a numbers thing. Okay, so workouts become much more specific in terms of goals the more advanced a person gets. Uh, but initial clients, initially, your goal is weight loss. Okay, great. Your goal is to get stronger in a deadlift. Okay, great. Your goal is to move better. Fine. You want to be more athletic? Fine. You want to build a lot of muscle? Fine. When you're a beginner, I'm going to look at you as an individual, and there's I have to start with getting you to move better before I can do anything else. Now, if you're training with me for a year – and you want to get a better squat, then we start to get more specific with the training, right? But the weight loss one's interesting to me because a weight loss workout is the same as a muscle building workout. That's right. Yeah. There's no difference. In fact, all workouts and, with strength training should be- And by the way, both that client is being trained the same way, ironically, if they want to build muscle or lose That's body fat say, and, yes. ha and or have bad posture or not. Yeah. Like you're just going to incorporate- the Goal is preserving muscle and building muscle. That's right. And, and the only little bit of a difference maybe is like if I had a client who had perfect posture, which never happens, but let's pretend like this for this conversation happened- uh, then there might be some corrective exercises that I don't integrate into the training per se. Well, now you're talking about the individualization. And right. It really doesn't change anything, right? Yeah, it really doesn't. No, you're still doesn't. you're still going to program in that way. And by the way, uh, most people have a lot of the similar issues, right? Have problems retracting and depressing their shoulders, have some sort of an anterior pelvic tilt, um, have knees that are caving. A lot of these like issues are similar. So when you start building a lot of these routines and, and you start putting in exercises that are going to help them in those areas, uh, they it looks the same for every type of client, whether it's a muscle building, a fat loss or whatever, yeah. you're going to integrate things into the program that are going to address those things. And you're not, it's not a subpar program. You're not sacrificing uh, like, it's oh, this, they're not the going to get weight way. loss because I'm, I'm addressing their posture stuff. Like, no, we're we're working on building muscle and we're doing that. Totally. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out guides. We have free guides that can help you with so many different fitness and health goals. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out. And less injury. That's another yeah. thing. You'll see less injury as well.